Superheroes, whether you love or hate them, they've been a staple of American culture since the late 1930s. Superheroes stand for, at the bare minimum, fighting for justice in times of peril. We all have our favorite heroes, be it the classics or more recently introduced heroes, but at the end of the day, it's all just for fun and the love of the genre, right? No! Well, that's how it is for a majority of casual viewers. Fans who are more invested may stand to disagree. See, there's a specific subsect of fans that cannot stand to agree to disagree, and it's causing a lot of backlash towards the genre. Today, we're going to be looking at the fandom behind DC Comics, but specifically surrounding the films of Zack Snyder. This fandom has been dubbed by many as the Snyder Bros. Now, this will probably be my most divisive video since the rise and fall of Spider-Man Lotus. So before we get into it, I just want to make it clear. I do not hate Zack Snyder or his fans. I adore Snyder's take on Watchmen, despite the metatextual inaccuracies towards the source material. I love 300. I love Sucker Punch. In fact, Sucker Punch is one of the most underrated action movies to come out of the 2010s. This video is mainly focused around objectively psychoanalyzing the fan base, or the Snyder Bros, rather than critiquing Snyder as a director. This isn't a hate video. This isn't me saying... Look at these people enjoying themselves. Wow, let's rip on them. No, that's not what this is. I promise. No. So who is Zack Snyder exactly? Well, he's an American director and producer whose career really launched with his remake of Dawn of the Dead in 2004. If you follow DC films, then it's very likely that you've come across the name before, as these works tend to be his most popular and have come to be known as the Snyderverse. Zack's history with film dates back to his childhood, which he spoke on during an interview for The Hollywood Reporter in 2011, saying, I was like a maniac. My mom bought me my Super 8 camera when I was 11 a Canon 1014 XLS. The first movie I ever shot was a stop-action Star Wars movie with my Star Wars figures. He continues to detail his early life in which he was constantly filming and coming up with new ideas for different things to film. Zack shared that the camera allowed him to express himself in a whole new range of ways that otherwise wouldn't have been possible, which seems to be a sentiment that is echoed by many cinematographers on how they found their calling. And for Zack, the camera did call. He didn't limit himself in the types of videos that he filmed either, as much of his early career was working on music videos for various artists like ZZ Top, Lizzie Borden, and even My Chemical Romance. After the launch of Dawn of the Dead in 2004, his attention shifted from music videos and short films to feature films and the glamour of Hollywood. Zack began working on larger projects and gaining notoriety for his style and genre of films. But the most notable break in his career was during the post-production of Justice League in 2017, where Snyder had to step away from filmmaking due to the unfortunate passing of his daughter, Autumn. After the devastating passing of his daughter, Zack became involved in raising awareness for mental health and prevention. He has since returned to the film industry with more determination than ever, crediting the fans and their curiosities as one of the reasons that he even made his return in the first place, and that fan base was ready to back him at every turn upon his arrival. Now that we get an idea of The Who, let's talk about his actual film history, his filmography. Even if some don't enjoy his work, Zack has had his hands in a lot of projects to various degrees. I'm not going to evaluate every single one individually, or this video would be like 10 hours long, but we're going to touch on the work that he's done with DC, as these are the films that seem to cause the most discussion within his fandom. But as a catch-all, many of his works have pretty mixed reviews right off the bat. Watchmen was very mixed upon its release, but... I love it. 300 was a hit, if I remember correctly. I like that one a lot, too. And Sucker Punch was trashed by critics, but that's one that I also really like. No! Man of Steel is a movie depicting the origin story of Superman that was released in 2013. 
It comes in at an astounding two and a half hour runtime, and it takes on an edgier style that many weren't really accustomed to at the time. Sure, we had just gotten off of the Dark Knight trilogy, but this was Superman. Man of Steel was clearly directed for a more mature audience, using language, violence, and a very shiny PG-13 rating that we see throughout his movies. It also made one specific choice that was met with some criticism. Superman was very violent in this movie. There's a level of violence to be expected in these kinds of movies. Superheroes fight the bad guys. That's how it works. Uh, but the last hour of this movie can best be described as all hell breaks loose. It's a mass destruction event, flying through fuel tanks and buildings and destroying everything in their way. And the suffering caused by these actions is shown, but kind of disregarded. This chaos and destruction all ends with Superman very unceremoniously snapping Zod's neck. Despite the popularity of the character, the movie was met with very mixed reviews, with some even going as far as to say that the portrayal of Superman in the movie was a betrayal of the original character and his values. I can see where they're coming from, considering the other depictions of Superman and, in turn, Clark Kent still keep true to his original love and respect for humanity as a whole. This is often depicted in the comics through seemingly mundane actions that show respect and love for all of humanity. One of my favorite examples is a comic where Superman is eating lunch with a rehabilitated convict named Glenn. At one point, this is even called out by Glenn when he's talking about a problem with his son. Son. Superman showed nothing but respect for a man who learned the hard way, paid for his crimes, and made a better life for himself, which I think really shows a developed moral understanding that we don't really get to see even in our everyday lives. Aside from this, in the comics, we also see him fetching lost toys for kids and making them promise that they'll always wear their seatbelt to be safe. But the most notable example of this depiction in film is Christopher Reeve's portrayal of Superman in his four-movie saga. The first movie of this series, Superman the Movie, from 1978, was revolutionary for the time, particularly with its special effects, and it was selected for preservation by the Library of Congress's National Film Registry in 2017. It was received incredibly well with critics at the time. Joe Shuster, who co-created the character of Superman, stated that he was delighted to see Superman on the screen. I got chills. Chris Reeve has just the right touch of humor. He really is Superman. Which is an insanely amazing review to get from the creator of the character. While some felt that the enemies in those movies were a bit overly cartoonish, it keeps the original spirit. There's a light-hearted tone in that first movie, and we don't see Superman destroying entire cities with reckless abandon. Everything, down to the way the film was written, shot, and produced, gives it a noticeably light overtone compared to Man of Steel. And I think a really specific moment showing the heart of this character is in Superman 2, the sequel, in which Lois Lane shoots Superman at point-blank range. He doesn't flinch, he doesn't get angry at all, in fact, he just kind of tilts his head and looks up as if to say, really? This was an expression of Lois's courage in herself, as well as the natural curiosity of the human spirit. And in that moment, I believe his reaction and the response given to Lois really embodies what Superman is, forgiving, kind, and understanding. I'm going to be honest with you, I could literally go on for hours about the Richard Donner movies. I might make a video on that, I don't know. But, like, I got goosebumps just talking about that scene. Like, it's Oh, man. So we have seen Superman struggle with his identity on screen many times. And I do think that an excellent representation of this aspect of the character is the TV series Smallville. In this show, we get to see Clark as a teenager growing up in Smallville. While the show isn't as dark in theme as some of the movies and even Snyder's take, I think there's a good balance between Clark struggling with his identity in the universe and his needs to protect the citizens of the Earth. Getting back to Snyder's work now, and not talking about any other iterations of the character and just talking about it as is, I think it's important to consider the darker thematic tones and plot may be the reason as to why this audience of Zack Snyder's fans like these films so much. I think the easiest way of explaining this conflict between Snyder bros and non-Snyder bros 
is that non-Snyder bros don't like this violent take on Superman. They don't like how Snyder depicts these characters. They don't like that Batman kills. They don't like this darker, miserable tone. Whereas the Snyder bros love it for that, despite the comics not really having that aspect of the characters in them. Personally, I think the violence could have been toned down a bit, but this wasn't an altogether unpleasant movie for me. In fact, I love this movie. Well, I did when I first saw it. Granted, I was 11 years old at the time. <laughs> I thought that if something was dark and edgy, that meant that it was automatically good. My attitude towards the film has been soured in recent years, especially after exploring the character of Superman in the realm of comic books and realizing how vastly different this take on the character was from his comic book counterpart. One aspect of the film that I still feel really conflicted about is the overbearing symbolism of Schneider's Superman being an analogy for Jesus Christ. Now, as a, as a Catholic myself, uh, I can sort of understand why Snyder would take this route. He very clearly views these superheroes as gods, but it just feels off to me for two reasons. One, Superman's creators, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, were Jewish, and his origin story in the comics is very much based off of the story of Moses, which feels weird taking a character like this and then comparing him to Christ. And the second reason I feel iffy about this is that this same character causes like several 9-11s in this movie. The film performed well at the box office, and critically, the scores were pretty evenly split. This movie was received well enough for DC to greenlight Zack's work on another film in 2016. Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice is the second installment in his trilogy, in which we see Batman and Superman being pitted against each other by Lex Luthor, eventually fighting the reanimated mutant corpse of Zod. That's supposed to be Doomsday, but like, oh. What the hell is even that? Batman v Superman takes a look at a mentally crumbling Batman, a Superman acting out of desperation to save the people he loves, and an Earth that's trying to recover from the immense damage that was caused in Man of Steel. We see humanity at its most cynical, and while this may not be an unrealistic reaction based on events of our past, it sets a much darker tone for the film than you may be used to seeing in this genre, and that tone lingers throughout the end of the film. The film's greatest criticism is that while its premise could be very engaging, the execution of the plot, along with certain stylistic choices, caused it to fall flat. Many were complaining that the movie's dialogue, along with the actual fight scene between Batman and Superman, were unimpressive and underwhelming, which is something I kind of agree with. With the untimely death of Superman in the last film, Earth is now under threat by hostile extraterrestrial threats that are aware that Earth is free of the last Kryptonian. Filled with determination after Superman's sacrifice, Batman, joined now by Wonder Woman, set off to gather a team strong enough to save the Earth from being completely destroyed. They travel far and wide to eventually collect a team including the Flash, Cyborg and Aquaman. Once they've reassembled at Batman's home, evidence is brought to light that it could be possible to reanimate Superman in a similar way that Zod is revived in the last movie. They head to Metropolis, revive Superman, and after some minor hiccups from being reanimated, they get to work defending the Earth. Once again, we see some mixed reviews on this movie, sitting firmly at a 40% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, 6.1 on IMDb, and 45% on Metacritic. With one reviewer, Brian Eggert, starting his review with Diverting, but not engrossing. Expensive, but cheap looking. Action-packed, but not exciting. Amusing, but not funny. Many complained that the movie felt disingenuous. Like, a lot of this has to do with Joss Whedon, who took over after Zack Snyder had to step away from the project after the loss of his daughter. Some people argued that Whedon saved the movie from total failure in post-production, but it's worth noting that many people, myself included, enjoyed Snyder's cut of the Justice League more than the original release in 2017. In fact, I think 
the general consensus is that the Snyder Cut is better than the theatrical release. This could be attributed to conflicting viewpoints on how the plot should be laid out, or the fact that the four-hour runtime of Snyder's Cut allows for more room for some plot that felt really rushed in the theatrical cut. So as I mentioned, the main point of this entire segment is to show that Nearly every single film in Snyder's trilogy had mixed to negative reviews. Regardless of the movie, that's just the way it is. Objectively, these received mixed reviews from critics and audiences. As a foreword, in my video talking about the Godzilla fandom, I introduced the toxicity triangle. We will be referencing that today. So specifically, I'll be talking about the polarization and the toxic tiers. In case you forgot, here's a very brief explanation of the tiers that I introduced in that video. So what is a toxic fan base? Well, to determine this, I created a pyramid of sorts. It's kind of like the food pyramid, if you're American and you remember that from back in the day. The way it works is there are three main Main tiers that determine whether or not a fan base is or isn't toxic. If a fan base makes it all the way to the top tier, then they are a toxic fan base. Due to the nature of this video, we'll be skipping over the mild negativity tier because for the most part, a lot of people in that tier tend to be the voice of wisdom in any online discussions as fighting breaks out pretty easily on this topic. Most of the trouble is going to come from the polarization tier. We've covered the basics, so let's get into what's happening in this fandom. Zack Snyder's fans have gained attraction for being in incredibly hostile fandom. But why is this? Well, the answer may be a bit more nuanced than we're led to believe. In the case of the DC fandom, the arguments begin between who was better, James Gunn or Zack Snyder. And they go hard, like really hard, like bringing up deceased daughters in arguments level. A lot of the explosive arguments hinge on stylistic choices ad hominems, you know, like personal attacks, and there's a focus on Snyder's darker perspective, making things more realistic. It's also worth establishing that when asked what he said to James Gunn when he found out that Gunn would be essentially taking over DC, Snyder told The Hollywood Reporter, I called him and said, I wish all the best for him. I told him I wanted it to work. And other reports indicate that the two, while stylistically being very different artists, are friends. A lot of this drama is genuinely just between the fans having this made up war in their brain. It's like QAnon, but for nerds, where these two directors are pinned against each other due to a difference in taste. And one is trying to undermine the other with all these subtle little Easter eggs in their movies. When in actuality, they're like, two former co-workers. So we're going to stick to the polarization tier for examples of these interactions on social media for two reasons. One is that this is where a lot of his fans seem to sit, or at least the most outspoken ones. And the second reason is that a lot of the comments from the more toxic side of this fandom are just straight up depressing. And I'd like to keep the tone of this somewhat upbeat. Now, again, I just want to preface this again. I'm like making this clear. I don't hate Snyder. I don't hate his fan base. I obviously don't condone any of this behavior, though. It's perfectly normal and healthy to be able to not like something. And it's totally fine to like... Okay, water break. I'm like dying right now. It's perfectly normal and healthy to be able to not like something, and it's totally fine to like something. As I said in the beginning of this, there's no accounting for taste, and with that in mind, let's take a look at some of the things being posted. On X, the site formerly known as Twitter, a user posted, why does he, Snyder, add so much SA? Another user, we'll call user2, reposted with the caption, because Zack Snyder really hates predators. Very strange thing to complain about. OP replied, just a question. I didn't complain. Which prompted user 2 to reply, cool. I'm sure you decided to tweet the question out instead of actually watching his movies and answering the question for yourself because you weren't being disingenuous. Which continues on for a bit longer with nothing really being said on the topic, just extended hostility. Another reply seen is, why is there essay on Rebel Moon? Sir, have you not seen how the villains look? They're literally space Germans from 1940. I'm not going to say the word because YouTube. What did you expect? And another, 
because they prefer stories where you're told the evil guy is evil, but you never see them do the evil things on screen. Adding further criticism to a relatively harmless question, especially one surrounding such dark themes and, you know, material, when presented with a question not even phrased as a critique, and the first thought in the fandom is, we're being attacked. That's not a healthy mentality. It's emotionally charged interactions like these that give this fandom such a bad reputation and in turn can reflect badly on superhero fandoms as a whole. SA is a very, very, very sensitive topic for a lot of people. So it makes sense that they would kind of be upset that that was in a movie. Not saying that it shouldn't be in movies. I'm just saying I understand why they're a little bit upset and why it's a consistent thing that keeps popping up in his movies. On X, another user posted, Breaking, the DCU has officially cast its Joker for the untitled Batman the Brave and the Bold. Joker is to be played by none other than himself, James Gunn, because he's a effing clown, followed by hashtag fire James Gunn. Hashtag bring back Zack Snyder. Hashtag restore the Snyderverse. Another user posted, James Gunn fans whenever we make a post, which was replied to stating, aren't you the guy that photoshopped Gunn in a torture scene? And the answer was no, but they were one of the commenters that interacted with it. Under a Reddit thread titled, What's the General Consensus on the Snyderverse? A user commented on how they felt the movies had some tonal issues, explaining, It has some cool moments, but had some terrible tonal issues and creative choices. Joker killed Dick Grayson off screen? Boo. Batman killed a lot of people. Superman was not a beacon of hope. The whole Pa Kent tornado sucked too. Barry always felt more like Wally West. Superman died in his second movie. Most of all, the rush to catch up to what Marvel was doing, but going so far as to introduce Aquaman, Flash, and Cyborg as email attachments, all were failures due to, I'm sure, just trying to rush it. Another user underneath wrote out quite the paragraph as a reply, starting it out with, In the Snyderverse, there were zero tonal issues and no bad creative choices, which is a, 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 a bold statement. <laughs> they went on to point out every single time that opinion could have been considered hypocritical, which would have been a fine argument on its own if it wasn't clearly motivated to prove OP wrong rather than propose another side of the argument. In February, one user posted on X, absolute beast of a Superman. Henry Cavill's Superman was perfect in every way with an attached image of Superman from all three of Zack's trilogy. A user replied underneath, good example of why this just doesn't work. He literally looks like a bad guy in all these pics. Also, he can look cool, which I don't necessarily disagree with, especially considering the way his face sits in these photos. Angry and hateful. That's not Superman. This is an interesting example of how Snyder's fans see the character versus the character's original portrayal because we get a chance to see what his fans want out of a superhero. It's projected onto Snyder's depiction of Superman. While everybody wants something different out of these movies, I think it isn't unreasonable to say that maybe his ideas would have been better on characters of his own making, rather than being put on a character with a very different reputation. As we mentioned before, one of the co-creators of the character championed a much less dark and morally ambiguous portrayal as the perfect Superman. And while it does boil down to taste, it's it's important to keep information like that in mind. These are just some examples that I picked up when I searched his name on social media. In fact, I also didn't have to dig super far to find something that took this fandom's toxic claim to the next level.
The amount of harassment that was directed at those working at Warner Bros. increased campus-wide security due to some death threats being sent to the higher-ups from Snyder's fandom. When asked about it, Snyder didn't have much to say on the subject, instead choosing to highlight the amount of money donated to charities for unaliving as the reason his fans couldn't be bad. From The Hollywood Reporter, I'm not going to comment on the details of whether they are good or bad, whether they are toxic or bullying. That's in every chat room. It's what comes with the internet. But I do know that the work they did on some level was good. I can say for a fact that they did good. That is undeniable. While it is truly a fantastic thing to raise well over $500,000 for a charity, especially one for unaliving prevention. I'm sorry I have to keep saying that, but YouTube is so stupid. Creators, though, do need to denounce toxic behavior among their fans. Later on, an article would eventually come out that would shed some light on a different controversial aspect of the fandom, and that's botting. Up to 13% of users that tweeted hashtag release the Snyder Cut were bots, and after an investigation was launched, this was proven to be true. The report also noted that there is an average amount of bots that you find in these specific circles. And according to the article, these numbers were well above average. According to two reports commissioned by Warner Media and recently obtained by Rolling Stone, at least 13% of the accounts that took part in the conversation about the Snyder Cut were deemed fake, well above the 3 to 5% that cyber experts say they typically see on any trending topic. When commenting about this, Snyder once again dodged the question, stating, The truth is, it doesn't matter. The movie got made. If they were smart enough to employ bots in this thing, then they won. That movie has no business existing, and it does. He did make somewhat of a statement on his fans' behaviors during an interview with Wired. It's one of the more direct statements on his fan base that I've personally come across during my research. Let me pull at that thread, because your name is now associated with the downsides of extreme fandom. These days, internet shorthand for aggressive bullying in fandom is like Snyder Cut fans, many of whom actually were harassing people and posting vitriol online. Look, there's tons of toxic fans, and I don't condone that behavior, but for every toxic fan, there were legitimate and ridiculous and really incredibly dark attacks on me, my family. I'm not justifying any bad behavior, but also I'm in this conversation with this fandom, where I have tried to make the work as best I can. On top of everything, your work is so polarizing. Nearly every article about you says something to the effect of whether you love or hate his movies. How do you make sense of that? It's weird that people care that much, that they would hate the movies. I'm more interested in the analysis of what draws that kind of ire. The fandom has emerged in this strong way. They're not casual. I make movies with the motivation to create something for the fans where they get to care about it as much as possible. That's the sort of bargain that I've struck. I think that's the closest he's gotten to denouncing toxic behavior within his fans. He does speak on how it's affected him as well, which is an important factor to remember when we're looking at cases like these. They aren't just affecting those in online spaces. These behaviors impact the lives and reputations of creators. It's got to be sobering to have people directly ask you about your fan base's toxicity constantly, especially when really good things can come out of these spaces, like the charity donations. There's a balance somewhere between the creator and the individual contributor in these spaces, and they both hold blame to a certain degree in these situations. No. So why do we have these kinds of interactions plastered everywhere in this fandom? Well, first, I think we should take a look at superhero fandoms as a whole, because it's not an isolated group in this genre. We see an increase in toxicity within all superhero spaces, and there may be a few reasons for this phenomenon. Superheroes were initially geared towards kids during World War II. They were a great tool for keeping the American spirits high, especially in capturing patriotism in the younger generations. There were even comics made of popular superheroes at the time, depicting them fighting the opposing forces in the war, like the iconic comic book cover of Captain America punching Hitler in the face. These comics were brightly colored, somewhat upbeat, and aimed towards a younger audience, which would continue to be the target audience in this genre for many years. Many of us enjoyed these comics, and later the movies. 
in our youths and still today. However, eventually people grow up and they get to a point where they may not want to associate with things that are traditionally childish. Or if they do like something that could be considered childish, they may feel the need to lash out in defense of it. The latter is less of a statement on the individual and more of a statement on the social atmosphere we've created surrounding adulthood. In reality, there's nothing wrong with liking things that may be traditionally considered childish. There's plenty of movies and shows from when I was younger that I still enjoy immensely. I'm still a goofy goober. But society hasn't always been that laid back. There are still a lot of people who criticize enjoying media typically geared towards a younger audience, and that in turn puts people on the defense right away. From where I'm standing, we all could use a hero from time to time. Stories of humans with superpowers or super strength that defend us have been around since the creation of the gods themselves. It's very human to like the idea of a superhero, and that's been proven more than once. In her thesis, Brianna Craig took a look at the psychology behind superheroes and us regular humans. She found that we tend to give superheroes the same qualities that we would assign the ideal person. When compared against results in a set of three studies surveying the value of certain characteristics in people, she later noted on the trustworthiness of superheroes, saying, quote, Superheroes display dispositional signs of trust because you can judge their character through their actions and their story arc. You can see that they always tell the truth and follow up on their promises. Superheroes also display contextual signs of trustworthiness because they have a role in situations as the hero, which automatically puts them in a position to be trusted. Otherwise, who would save all of the civilians? Another study was done on the effects of watching superhero movies on audiences and the positive effects did outweigh the negative generally. But it is worth noting that there was an uptick in negative or aggressive behaviors, specifically in men, that are presented after consuming superhero content, as well as a decreased emotional intelligence and critical thinking skills. This could be another contributing factor, especially considering the dark tones and amount of violence that we've established are found in Snyder's work. While it's not fair to blatantly blame aggressive behaviors on any individual piece of media or stylistic choices, because each individual is, well, that, an individual with many contributing factors. It is something, though, to keep in mind when we look at these spaces. Another good resource is a book titled Our Superheroes Ourselves, which is a collection of essays written on various aspects of the whole superhero genre and how or why they impact us psychologically. It obviously touches on the fact that we are all individuals and our unique life experiences shape the way we intake and engage with this content, but I think it offers some valuable insight into the emotions that fuel the behaviors we see in these online spaces. While this may only affect a small amount of viewers, it could also be a contributor as to why why this genre is so toxic. Arguments can turn into something incredibly personal very quickly for some, especially if they feel strongly connected with the story itself. The stereotypes surrounding the genre, as well as these psychological factors, are what I believe to be the first factor that makes this fandom so charged. And really, all superhero fandoms seem to have this underlying theme in them as well. Eventually, the superhero genre adapted to include a wider audience. Over the years, we've seen this genre branch out to include older audiences in various ways, be it how the movie is shot, the dialogue, plots, etc., all with varying degrees of success. When executed correctly, these adjustments make for fantastic pieces of media, but there has to be an amount of thought put into the application of these adjustments. There's a lot to be said about bringing a character up to speed, especially ones who have been around for so long, like the Justice League, and it's been done well several times over the years. So why are Snyder's films under scrutiny so much? For starters, Snyder has admitted to going into his projects with the idea that he wants them gritty dark and twisted, which on its own is not necessarily good or bad, but it has to fit the tone of the narrative as well. You have to allow the story to have its own life. If you force a stylistic choice on a story, it can lead to the end product being somewhat dull and forced. For example, Tim Burton's 1989 adaptation of Batman brought him back to his darker gothic origins, which was also very well received. This was huge because, at the time, Batman and his villains were mostly up to zany mischief and joking around. I mean, 
Before this, people really only thought of Batman as Adam West. There's room for darker tones and themes in this genre. It's been proven over and over again, but it has to be authentic. That's where the line between intention and execution lies. And that's what can make or break a project like that, especially when it's such beloved and established characters like these superheroes. While the darker tones can bring in an audience that might have otherwise not interacted with the genre, people were complaining that the movies were overall too dark thematically. It's also appropriate to consider where the line is societally when we look at the amount of violence and heartache on screen. <laughs> It's important to have a certain balance, and it's important to evaluate where you stand individually. Now, for me personally, I have to have an eclectic taste in film because I can't surround myself with media that's super dark. Otherwise, I get super depressed and anxious if that's all that I'm taking in. Sure, I love some depressing movies every once in a while. Trust me, I make videos on them. But... I need some goofy goober time as well. That's part of why I think it's so important to take a look at the individuals perpetrating the toxic behavior. Different types of media impact the way we view the world. In the same sense that listening to sad music can help other people when they're sad, but it can make other people feel way worse when they're not sad. Regardless of your opinion on the matter, it's clear throughout the trilogy that there's a pattern in the way Zack makes his movies. You obviously want a trilogy to have a similar vibe because it's supposed to be cohesive, but a lot of his movies are obviously stylized, especially compared to other works from that genre at the time. And that's where our second factor comes into play. One of their major talking points is the style of his movies, be it that other people are not understanding or appreciating how true to life and realistic his work is. Under one of the more tame or perhaps moderated discussions about his work, many comment on the effects used, be it positively or negatively, and overall there's a good chunk of people who felt that a lot of his work is at least mediocre and somewhat pretentious. John Esposa wrote on this subject back in 2015, saying, quote, The problem with keeping the same filming style is that it needs to evolve with the artist or else they will be stuck in a permanent state of uninspired arrested development. This is where Snyder currently finds himself, a slave to conventions and predictability. If you don't like one of his movies, you're likely not going to enjoy any of his movies. And these behaviors indeed spring up naturally in any fandom because there is an emotional charge to the subject. And it's also true that they shouldn't be encouraged because fan spheres are a place to enjoy the things you enjoy with your community. People do seek out these online communities as a space to connect. For some, it may be their only way to connect with people. Some are wondering if Snyder may be spurring on these behaviors by his actions. Two such people, Anastasia Salter and Mel Stanfill, wrote a book analyzing a few leading auteurs involved in cult media, and they wrote Zack his very own chapter. Though he is mentioned quite often throughout the book, a point they make very clear that I'm inclined to bring up is that he is a genuine fan of the franchise he works under. You can tell in the way he speaks on the topic during interviews that his love for the superhero genre is incredibly genuine. But that's also where things can start to go wrong. Moreover, he is fanish in another sense. Upon closer examination, it begins to seem as if Snyder is not only the purest fanboy auteur, but a startlingly comprehensive embodiment of the very worst stereotypes of the fandom. They go on to explain that the way that Snyder views his own work and the more direct way he interacts with his fans gives him a unique status in which the fandom mimics what kind of behaviors they see from the person they're following. And in a way, I do see this to be true. A brief example of this is a quote pulled from an interview with Sean O'Connell with Cinema Blend. And it's a long one, so stay with me here. I think that's sour grapes. There's really no other way to say it. We know the people who were the architects of that narrative, and it's pretty obvious what their agenda is. Those are people that I've been held back from confronting by wiser people in the room, because I'd love to get at some of these characters. Some direct conversation would be nice. Just to say, one, you don't know shit about what you're talking about, and we can break down everything they've ever said. I can make a list. There's a few of these guys where I could just get a list of everything they've ever said that they thought was right, and I could tell them 
every single thing they've said is wrong. And so, in what world do you have any credibility anywhere to anyone? I would love the opportunity to just say to the world and to fandom in general who these fakers are and what should be done to them or with them. It's just a bunch of BS in regards to that toxic fandom, or it's a win for toxic fandom, again. In what world does this toxic fandom raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for unaliving prevention? How is that toxic fandom? They've probably achieved more than any other fan base and done more good than any other group. So I don't understand. I would love the opportunity to just say to the world and to fandom in general who these fakers are and what should be done to them or with them. That's a statement with aggression behind it. While it may not have seemed to be a huge statement in the moment, it's an important look into how his mind is ticking, and that does have an influence in these spaces. Their shared love for Snyder and his films is what I believe drives the toxicity in this fandom, and I think it's the way Snyder uses his community specifically that has caused it to gain notoriety for its abrasiveness. In an interview for the Sunday Times, Zack admitted to riling up his fans during a charity campaign to generate more donations, saying, quote, They've saved lives he said, referring to the money raised for the American Foundation of Unaliving Prevention. Again, I'm sorry I have to keep saying that. That's YouTube. It, it sucks. That's a fact. But on the other hand, was it fun to provoke them for a clickable thing? Yes. And they were an easy target, but they continue to raise money. He knows they're an easy target. He knows they're emotionally attached to the work he does. And he openly admitted to using it. While it may have been for a good cause... Does that excuse the behavior, or does it actually solidify the theory that Salter and Stanfill were working on? No. When you boil it down, I really think that we're seeing a group of vulnerable people, some of whom may lack that personal connection outside of the internet, coming together for their love of a director and having his love being formed in the image of a toxic culture that's been established around the superhero genre. I also think it does not help this particular fandom that Snyder pulls a lot of criticism due to his artistic choices and certain behaviors, which can engage the emotional parts in their brains that want to defend the things they enjoy. It's almost like a persecution complex of sorts. The word fandom has gained substantial notoriety since the formation of the internet, bringing together fans of all sorts of works and allowing them to connect with others just like themselves. In many ways, this is a fantastic thing. Many, if not all, of these groups are incredibly talented, producing their own fan works of their favorite media, and it allows a sense of community that others might not have had in their daily lives. But, as is with everything, this can quickly turn into a toxic environment. No matter where you stand, one thing is incredibly clear. We need to consider our emotions and attitudes when engaging with others online. There will always be toxic people in every fandom. It's the way of the world. It's up to the rest of the fans, the normal people, and the ones that are running these spaces to denounce that kind of behavior so it doesn't run rampant. Trying to respect each other's opinions online, especially when it comes to matters of taste, will result in less drama in these online spaces overall. Fandoms were made as a place of love and celebration, so let's work on keeping them that way. So I guess, uh, is this the most toxic fandom on the internet? No, not by a long shot. Unhinged at times? Sure, but it's in the name of love and adoration towards something that they enjoy. And with all of that out of the way, I'm Cole McCormick. You're watching Firewood Media. I want to thank Josh for helping me write this video. It's a video that has been in the works since September 2023. And without him, it likely would have never gotten made. Really quick side note, a lot of research was involved in this. Uh, all the sources and citations are all going to be down below in the description. So... Check that out if you're interested. Show some love to the people that we mentioned in here. And uh, yeah, just want to make that clear. Everything is down below in the description. So, you know, I'm not making anything up. <laughs> Consider becoming a member to support the channel. For just $1.99 a month, you'll receive member shoutouts and your name featured as an executive producer in all of our film projects. There's also going to be members-only videos as well as exclusive behind-the-scenes content that you won't find anywhere else. Plus, enjoy exclusive production updates and photos straight from the heart of Firewood Media. 
You don't have to if you don't want to. It's just an extra perk for anyone that wants to support the channel while also getting to see some unique content. Either way, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.